Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. Through two movies in Canon Films' Ninja Trilogy, that saying has come to be the recurring theme throughout. But it gets put through the ringer like never before with one of the most insane films to ever spring from the maniacal minds of Golan and Globus. Ninja 3, The Domination. A film that can charitably be described as a flash dance, the exorcist, martial arts fever dream. Only canon, I tell you. Only canon. In the two previous real actions, we've talked about canon films and how expert they were in spotting the hot trends and cashing in. One of those was the ninja craze of the 1980s, which they can rightfully be thanked for with Enter the Ninja and Revenge of the Ninja. At the center of these films was the brilliant martial artist and legit ninpo badass Sho Kasugi, who played two completely different roles in the earlier ninja films and returns for Ninja 3 in yet another wildly different role. But then, everything about this one is wildly different. They probably could have put that in the title, Ninja 3, Wildly Different Edition. Because this time, Sho would do more than just fight another ninja, he'd be a one-eyed seeker of justice battling the demonic spirit of an evil ninja who has possessed the body of a part-time fitness instructor and line worker named Christy. Say, say what? Yeah, Ninja 3 isn't content to just be about ninja battling ninja. Golan and Globus, once again spotting the trends, picked up on the red-hot popularity of 1983's Flashdance combined with paranormal horror flicks such as Poltergeist to make one of the weirdest concoctions ever. Only Canon could make this stuff work. Canon was quick to follow up on the success of Enter the Ninja and Revenge of the Ninja, but they wanted this third film in the trilogy to be something different. So they cast newcomer Lucinda Dickey to be both the protagonist and the antagonist. As Christy, the physically fit Dickie put on quite a show, so much that she impressed Cannon who cast her in both Breakin and the sequel, Breakin 2 Electric Boogaloo. In fact, it was Breakin that actually was released first, with Ninja 3 riding the wave of Dickie's newfound stardom. Electric Boogaloo would quickly follow, with all three films being released in 1984. This is what happens when everyone is hopped up on speed. But Dickie's ascension meant that somebody had to take a step back. Sho Kasugi, who became the face of the ninja craze and one of Canon's biggest stars, wasn't happy about seeing his role diminished. Sure, he still got to play a ninja hunter on the trail of the ninja who had murdered his clan, took his eye, and possessed Christie's body, but this was her film and not his. Christie not only goes on a killing spree across the city, hunting down the cops who filled the ninja's body full of bullets, but she also gets a steamy relationship with, uh, oh my god, she's being mauled by that walking carpet. Oh, whew, that, that, that's just co-star Jordan Bennett, who plays Christie's cop boyfriend, Billy Secord, despite a desperate need for a shave and an apparent appreciation for V8, Billy's one of the good guys. A little naive for failing to notice that his girlfriend is a ninja serial killer, but hey, what guy hasn't been blinded by love, am I right? Sam Furstenberg, who directed Kosugi in Revenge of the Ninja, returned to helm this third film as well. Again, Sam shows his skill at crafting believable, easy to follow action scenes. Of course, Kasugi was once again handling fight choreography, which was a big help. The best scene is right off the bat. Notice that in each ninja film, they hook you with an absolutely massive bloodbath scene. 
This one takes place on a golf course where the ninja, played by future Indie Spirit Award nominee David Chung, massacres a bunch of pompous rich dudes and one innocent woman before they can get in their 18 holes. How rude! He then goes on to slaughter pretty much the entire police department before they finally figure out they have the numbers and overwhelming firepower to take him down. What's impressive about this is how long the killing goes on. Pretty sure it was as long as an actual golf match. Later, the cops will put on their best stormtrooper act, missing every shot at Christie during a chase and graveyard battle that is both awesome and comical. Pretty sure those headstones are made out of chalk. Sam's spoken quite frequently, including with us here at Real Action, about the decision not to have Kasugi be the lead. Sam didn't get the decision, but as a professional filmmaker, he went along with it. Kasugi was adamantly against the idea of a female ninja. It took a lot of work to get Kasugi to return, but Sam did it by having Christy not really be a ninja just possessed by a male one. Kasugi was cool with that. It's over now. In retrospect, Kasugi might be pretty happy they didn't have to do some of the stuff Dicky had to do. Dicky had a blazingly short acting career with only three lead roles to her credit before retiring, but she quickly established herself as gifted athletically. She's more than credible when out there kicking ass, even though she had to quickly bone up on all the martial arts stuff. It's the other side, the kind of skeevy, awkward romantic scenes that are just uh, ugh. like this one where she slinks into a hot tub with a guy and a couple of other pissed off chicks of course she slaughters them all but what's with all the weird foreplay i'm sorry is that the ninja's influence i don't get it Along with the absolutely gonzo concept, Canon went way overboard with the product placement on Ninja 3 in ways they've never done before. Furstenberg has said the production received loads and loads of V8 from advertisers, and so to make them happy, he just, well, made a seduction scene out of it. As a kid, I thought this meant she was a vampire too. Maybe she was, I don't know. And what was with the bouncer video game? Somehow it managed to possess an already possessed Christie, giving new meaning to the term video game addict. It also was there as a way of cramming in some product placement to appease the money folks, although now the bouncer arcade cabinets are like a collector's item, so if you got one, put it on eBay for some sweet, sweet coin, my dude. Maybe we better stop. No. You finish it. Get rid of the son of a bitch. The 80s were just nuts. And Ninja 3 The Domination might be one of the best examples of how unhinged that time was. Unfortunately, the fickle American consumer had started to turn their attention to other fads by this point, And the box office reflected it. The film only made a little over $7 million which is okay considering the $2 million budget. And of course, it became a cult favorite that killed in home video sales. Canon wasn't hurt by this one at all. Well, at least not financially. They had alienated Kasugi with Ninja 3 and he struck out on his own after this. His career was spotty after parting from Canon, making a comeback many years later with Ninja Assassin in 2009. Ninja 3 was not only the final film that Dickie did with Canon, it was her final lead role, period. 
After appearing in 1988's Cheerleader Camp, she quietly retired from acting. Ninja 3 of Domination isn't the kick-ass flick that Revenge of the Ninja was. It's the kind of film you watch with a bunch of buddies over some frosty adult beverages and a mountain of chicken wings. As a representative of everything that made canon great and special, I can't think of a movie that does it better. Is it true that only a ninja can destroy a ninja? It's true. Ninja 3 The Domination gets 7 out of 10 Stallones. Uh, moving, moving on to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, 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 to Ninja three, what was the relationship like between you and show going into that one? Because he kind of gets moved to the background a little bit in that movie. And it's, it's kind of a different kind of film, you know, it's, it's arriving around the time when, uh, breakdancing is, uh, is starting to come along and, and, you know, and there's a lot more fantasy and supernatural elements. How did your relationship work out with that film, with his role kind of changing? Okay. Now, we finished the movie. Uh, I'm going back to Revenge of the Ninja. We finished mm -hmm. the product, everything, ready, finished the product. And Canon Film was a young starting company. Yeah. And like many other independent companies that I mentioned before, Corelco, etc. Now, the dream of every company, independent company, is when they finish a movie, they will give it, they will be able to sell it to a major distributor. When I say major, I mean studios. Yep. So Universal, it's called pickup. So Universal will pick up the movie, Paramount will pick up the movie. But that's pretty hard because the standards of those companies are very high. They don't pick up, they don't pick up any small, tiny movie. They want the movies to be on their at least minimal standard of quality. So Canon, by then they produced already few, few uh, uh, horror picture and those two action movies and some yeah. other. And they were always paddling around, trying to see who will pick up the movie, especially for North American distribution, what's called domestic distribution. And none of those movies were ever picked up by any company. <laughs> and suddenly they showed it, of course, so Revenge of the Ninja, they show it, show it around, and MGM suddenly, MGM says, yes, we'll take it. MGM at the time, 73, 1973, was a big company, MGM UA, <clears throat> for distributing a movie. So they took it and they built a beautiful campaign. The poster behind you was actually prepared by MGM graphic department, not by Canon. Mm. They did they did the poster that is behind you right now. And a good campaign, you know, campaign in English, campaign in Spanish. They, they kind of invited me here and there out of being polite. And yeah. The director has nothing to do with the with the directors have nothing to do with with the marketing and distribution usually. But anyway, they were polite, yeah. invited me. So I saw radio uh, campaign, television campaign. And they opened the movie big, 800 theater in the East Coast, so-called East of the Mississippi. And then they moved the 800 print to the West, West of the Mississippi. It was pretty big in New York. The movie play was at the top of the box office when it opened, the week it opened. Mm. So the movie was successful suddenly and Canon was happy. They finally have relationship with the MGM. Of course, they want a sequel immediately. Another sequel. Okay, let's go for it. Yeah. Now, you come to a point that I don't know. I'm not in the knowledge. Something happened between Kenon and Sho Kasugi, Menachem Golan. You know, Sho was not only the star of Revenge of the Ninja. He was providing the wardrobe. He was providing the weapon. Yeah. He had a much bigger deal. Yeah, than he, just did. He, he did almost he did a lot he of stuff. His, his, his two sons into it. He was enterprise, Sho Kasugi enterprise. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, something happened, which I don't know. I don't know until today, or maybe from a commercial point of view. And then Menachem Golan calls me into his office. He says, Sam, we want to make a, a sequel, naturally, but I want to change it. I don't want uh, uh, Sho Kasugi to be the hero of the next movie. Hmm. And I, let's look for something else. I don't know. And he came up with the idea. He said, let's make it a woman. 
let's make it a young lady. She will be the hero. But, you know, at that time was uh, Elian, Sigonia Weaver. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> maybe they thought about, and, and of course, the uh, Flesh Dance. There were a few movies with a female s- star. Female Definitely a Flesh Dance. Carry on and, yeah. and did nicely in the box office. So maybe this, I, I don't know. I don't know the reason. I don't want to speculate <clears throat> too much. And from my point of view, it was okay. I didn't, I want to direct the movie. I don't have to, to voice my opinion. And actually, it's a challenge. So we had the same writer. Jim Silk was the writer of uh, Revenge of the Ninja, and he was hired to write a new movie, Ninja 3. We didn't have any idea, nothing, nothing, nothing. And we started to work on the script, but they wanted Shokasugi, the company. They didn't want him to be the hero anymore, but they wanted him in the story, one way or another. So that's the deal between them, I don't know. Now, obviously, so was upset. Here we have a movie that just came out, did so well, you know, to introduce the Western world to this concept of uh, ninja, doing doing well not only in North America, also all over the world. And the company wants to make another movie without him being the hero again, right? Or the 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 star of the show again, and and that's why he came to Hollywood to be a star. He wanted, as I said. And, and so that's upset, upset him a little bit or, or more than a little bit yeah. <laughs> or a lot. And secondly, he really objected the idea that a woman will be the hero of a ninja movie. Mm-hmm. He believed and he expressed it to us that a woman does not have enough power, physical power to carry on a movie, action movie of this kind. You know, it's not Sigonia Weaver going around with a gun. She has to act physical stuff. Right. And, you know, there was a Cynthia Rothrock at the time. Was She was not a big star, you know, but, but she yeah. did some martial art movies. And, and I did, the I, I did China that, O'Brien on our, on our oh, series a few, a few months ago. It's one of, my oh, favorite, wow, that's one, nice. of my, one of my personal favorites. So she was around. We considered her. She didn't, it didn't work out. She was considered to, to be the star. But it didn't work out for some reason. I don't remember. And, and, uh, and, 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 so there was objection from Shokasugi. He didn't want, he will not appear in a movie like this, etc. and so on and so on. So Jim Silk, the writer, and myself, we think about it. How do we break the, this deadlock? How do, what, what can we come up with? Any idea that will change, will break this? Yeah. And then at the time, Poltergeist was a big movie, of course. And I said, well, Poltergeist, that's a good idea. The, this woman of us, the hero, she's not a ninja. She's obsessed. She's, <laughs> she's, she was taking her body was taken hostage by a dead yeah. ninja, a real ninja. She's possessed. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's not her. She's overtaken, yeah. and and we presented this idea to Shokasugi. There will be a ninja, an evil ninja. He will die right away in the beginning. His spirit, he will take over her body. So he, he keeps his spirit. And everything she's doing is while she's possessed by this spirit of the ninja. And eventually, at the end of the story, you come and you have to save her. And you will have to fight. He will be resurrected and you will have to fight him. He loved, he bought the idea. <laughs> he agreed to this idea. And we were free, uh, Jim Silk, the writer, and myself to go ahead and write the script. Wow. So at the time, I was very influenced by uh, Poltergeist. I love Poltergeist, Toby Hooper movie. And, and you know, uh, Exorcist was the first horror movie I ever saw in my life. I never oh, saw wow. a horror picture before Exorcist. That's so hell of a place to me, uh, You know, Exorcist, what a movie. So yeah. he brought in elements for Exorcist. He brought in elements from uh, Poltergeist. And Flesh Dance that we mentioned was a big movie right there. This uh, woman who is an uh, industrial woman and she's a yeah. wilder and she danced in the evenings, appealed to us very much. We brought her into the story. <laughs> she came into the story. So, but eventually, what happened, the script became a hybrid of different genres of movies, folded into a ninja movie. So, you had ninja, yeah. you had poltergeist, you had the spiritual, you had exorcism, <laughs> the dancing lady, industrial lady. Became at the time it made sense to me. <laughs> I didn't know that it will it will look I, what do I say cheesy or crazy yeah. later on, 
and it will have a new life much, much later on. It's still a cold we, we couldn't we still we love it. We could not, in our wildest dream, we could not predict the history of this movie, what's going to happen to this movie within the years. So, yeah. but that's how, how it came about. Now, Shaw became very, you, you ask, your question was about Shaw Kasugi. He became very reserved. He told us right away, he's not going to train Lucinda, you know, we, yep, as I told Lucinda you, Dickie, Lucinda, yeah. Cynthia, I don't remember if Cynthia was working, busy. In any case, we ended up with Lucinda Dickey. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she was not, uh, she was cast to, to Breaking because she made the Ninja 3, but Breaking came out in the theater before Breaking, uh, before Ninja 3, the domination. Yep. So many people ask me if I saw, if we saw her in Breaking, but it was the other way around. Yeah. And, and uh, she was athletic, she was a dancer, Lucinda is a dancer, so, so we knew, you know, among the casting, and she had a nice broad shoulder, she had the element that will fit into this part. Definitely physical. And she was dancer, so she, she, will learn, she was not a martial artist, but we knew if she was dancer, she will learn the moves very quickly. It's not, not much different from a dance. Right. You know, talking about it, when I, even in Revenge of the Ninja, when I sit, sit back on my director's chair and I see Sho Kasugi perform, it's like a ballerina, it's like a ballet. Yeah. He's amazing. And there is a different, you can see yeah. different between different performance of different martial artists. Sho, Sho Kasugi is amazing. Yeah. I, I, later I work with Mike Stone. I work with Tadashi Yamashita. Those people are different level of beauty in the movement. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, so best, come back. the best so he was fights to me always look like a complicated dance between two people you know that's the way that's why the it best, yeah, best fight. especially those fights that they are not harming each other yeah you know, exhibition fights yeah so he 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 made it a point right away he's not going to train uh, lucinda uh his uh, assistant elena miel was in charge of the training <laughs> lucinda a taking care we, uh, we had the same stunt coordinator steve lambert with luckily enough he's also a martial artist and he's a uh, Pretty short, Steve Lambert. So he fits, uh, you know. So he doubled for Lucinda because of the height. <laughs> yeah. So Steve Lambert was the, the mm -hmm. double for Lucinda. He did most of the stuff that is supposedly Lucinda is doing. And uh, uh, and Shaw kind of was reserved more in this movie, unlike Revenge of the Ninja, that we cooperated tightly myself and him. This time, not so much. Yeah. But whatever it came to his. He's, uh, but he was still the advisor, the overall, the big advisor of martial art. So he would say, no, no, that's not the way it's done. Let's do it a little bit late. But he would send his assistants to work with Lucille. <laughs> and, and here and there, he doubles. Here and there, he doubles in the movie. But mainly, it was uh, Steve Lambert who, dumbled, who doubled. And in, his, in uh, some specific uh, areas, we needed uh, female gymnasts you know, to do specific stuff, flips, you know, double salt, stuff like that. So she also had a, there was also a, a double, and a, another a woman was around doubling here and Steve Lambert together. And, and but he was reserved. And we had the problem in the ending at the end of the movie with some kind of a conflict. Uh, in our mind, the writer and myself, at the end of the movie, Lucinda, which is now free of the spirit at the end of the movie, the spirit comes out of her, but still she ends up, she kills the, the, the evil ninja who came back to life. And this really did, didn't work for sure. He wanted to be the one. Yeah. And we had kind of a conflict, uh, you know, and eventually I told him, you know, sure, let's leave it. The, the final sequence, we, and this movie was filmed in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And with, in the temple, it starts inside the temple. We found the temple uh, and we, you know, decorated it. And it ended up in the in the hills, in the mountain outside. So it, it came to head, you know, we couldn't resolve it. As I told Sho, we told Sho, not only, you know, with consulting the company, say, you know, Sho, let's stop here. We'll edit the movie and we'll do the ending in Los Angeles. We'll find some mountain. So it was. So we finished the filming, eight weeks filming in uh, Arizona. We came home, we edited, completely edited the movie, and we decided to do the final uh, fight or final struggle between Sho and the evil ninja 
but still Lucinda I, so it's it's not very clear who ended who who killed one day I, I worked with Cho a few days with the evil ninja and then for one day I just they couldn't be together on the same I was gonna say day. I was gonna say the that's... other day I brought Lucinda no. and, uh, and Jordan her, the so-called he was the I boyfriend was... I was going to say, them to like show who send us shared a lot of screen time together. Like, and in editing, it's all editing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't seem like they shared a lot of screen time together. No, no. But even there is a fight, you know, they're, they're fighting in a building, in an uh, unfinished building, but it's not her. You know, mm-hmm. Because at this point, she's all covered with the... You know, so he's actually fighting with the, mainly with Steve Lambert, and she has a few close-ups, but yeah. Once she's covered totally and you only see her eyes, it's very easy to double. Very easy to double. I got. I gotta ask, what was your influence uh, behind the uh, the seduction scene uh, with the V eight can and all that? <laughs> what inspired you to do that scene? <laughs> but it uh, kind of it's coincidental. Few few things came out of it. Okay, we build this. Uh, her apartment, which modern industrial type of a, of an apartment, yeah. and her character was that she was independent, initiator. You know, she fights with the with the bad guys in the street later, and then so here you have this element. We have Lucinda, and on the other hand, you know there is something which is called product placement in movies. Yes, companies will give a lot of their product to a movie for free let's say drinks or wardrobe. And the only condition is that you use it in the movie. In, you know, in some big studio movies, they pay, it's a hidden advertising, advertisement. But in our case, in Revenge of the Ninja, we had Nike, you know, uh, Pete Vitali works, works at it. And we got so many Nike stuff, shoes and everything <laughs> for free, but Pete Vitali. Now here we got V8, tons and tons and tons of V8. So on the set, there were drinks, maybe the same company, maybe they gave us a few mm-hmm. more drinks, but there were tons and tons of these little little cans of V8 <laughs> on the set. And everybody who wants to drink, drink. But at some points we had to show it. So I said, okay, this on this particular scene, we'll put it on the <laughs> on the side next to the bed. So this will be our obligation to show the V8 scene. But we couldn't work out the seduction. Jordan. Bennett, Lucinda Dickey, and myself, we are talking about it. Uh, the standard, the Hollywood cliches to use champagne, to use wine. She pours the wine on herself and he's licking the wine, whatever, you know, the yeah. Hollywood. And then one of them, I don't think it was my idea, if I remember correctly, <laughs> maybe Jordan said, why don't we use the V8? <laughs> it was just right there. It's... And Lucinda, in the car, her character, that she, he, she's a health, health conscious, you know. Mm-hmm. She's exercising, she's an aerobic teacher. So it's fit for her as an actress. Yeah. It works, it, it's good. <laughs> it, it works with the character. Yeah. Jordan it's, liked it and I did not object. I, the I did classic scene, object. everybody loves that you scene. You know what? This movie is so crazy. This movie is so out of, out of any, any, any standard in a, in a Hollywood movie. Let's go for it, who cares? Let's see what happens. And that's what it happened.